Welcome to Stampscaping 101. This is a previously stamped out stamp sketch from, I believe it was probably for the uh, Seaside Cove um, stamp sketch, sketch demonstration video where I just use um, a portion of the Seaside Cove in uh, various configurations to show what you can do with it and how you can do partial stamping uh, of larger images for smaller format cards, okay? This is the Seaside Cove, and it's roughly, I don't know, it's like this lot, you know, big of an image. It's one of the biggest rubber stamps out there. And this is also um, a fairly large image in the Palms with Huts, but it's just using a smaller portion of it, okay? It goes out here, and it's roughly four and a half inches wide. And um, just to finish off this composition, we have the tiny rocks down here, and the reeds. Looks like I used large and small here. Okay, but I have a big um, stack of stamp sketches that are unfinished, but I thought I would try this one just using um, some markers here, kind of like a, like it'd be like an adult coloring book type of exercise, I guess you could say. So let's see what we can do here. Now I have a feeling I'm going to want to use some of this uh, pigment ink in um, kind of a fogging type of effect because what I like to get and achieve in my end results is I'd like to have a nice range of textures, okay? Now with things like alcohol pens, what I get is I get the mark that I want, but having it consistent over this whole um, surface here, um, from a textural standpoint, it gets a little bit repetitious for me, so I like to break that up a little bit by having some softer elements in here. Okay, now that being said, I'm not an expert at all at really anything, but um, especially when it comes to things like alcohol pens, uh, there's a lot of media that I haven't used a great deal of. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to use it in a general process that I use with whatever media I'm working with. Okay, that being said, um, when I'm mean by that is I generally work from light tones and incrementally through a darker range of values. It doesn't have to go all the way to black, although I often do with dye-based inks in my scenes. But I like to start light, okay? I, I feel that it's not a big commitment to the um, in value of the hue that I'm working in. Okay, the hue is the color that you're working in. The value is the relative light and darkness of something. Okay, so something like this, what I like to do is I like to establish what's going to be light and dark using these lighter tones that you start off with. So this is a really light color. It's aquamarine. It's, I don't know, I'd say it's like a I don't know, like a 7% value of blue, you know, zero being like nothing and, I don't know, 100% being like the darkest of, uh, you know, navy blues you can get. But uh, let's use that a little bit up here in the sky and in the water. Okay, now what I like to do in whatever type of scene that I'm working on, I like to have a little bit of a range of values, okay? So 
what I'm doing is, if you notice, I'm coloring those darker areas of the water. So oftentimes, uh, throughout this design, there's this thing called spin drift, or it's the uh, that little white water, you know, on top of the wave. And it's where that little mist comes off the crest of the wave as it's um, breaking. So, um, in the darker areas of the design, I'm coloring those areas in. But in the lighter areas, I might put a little bit just so it's not so stark white, okay? And this is a very light color that we're working with. But I leave those areas light, okay? So I re reiterate what's going on in the designs. And up here you can see I'm going in that darker area away. But see how this top area is lighter? But then we have this other line back here. And I'll just go in there like that. And I just generally have some little striations of white in there where I just didn't color them in, you know. You kind of oscillate things a little bit between having some ink and none. And that's the same thing I'm doing up here. I don't know if you can see, like right in here there's no ink. So you can hit it up here, you can hit it down here if you want. I mean there's no right or wrong. It's not as if, oh my gosh, I put that ink right there. That should have been white or something, you know. It's just, you kind of want to vary things just so that there's a little bit of variation with what you're doing. Okay, now down here in the rocks, you can see the darker areas of the rocks. And I'm just coloring those. Now I'm doing this on a glossy cardstock, but you can do this on a matte cardstock. You can stamp everything out and just kind of color it right in. Um, the inks work a little bit differently depending on the type of paper you use, like on a uncoated cardstock. I'm guessing that the inks could um, spread a little bit faster or easier, whatnot, um, than on a coated cardstock where maybe your media stays a little bit more surface oriented. Okay, now talking about the pens that I'm using, I'm using alcohol pens, the, these are the plume permanents. They're about two dollars a pen. Someone sent me these two packs, so. Um, but this is another pack right here of Shuttle Art. This 88 pack here cost $40, okay? But they're just alcohol pens. You can use whatever brand you have. Um, I got this one right here to kind of supplement these two other packs right here. I often don't use too much of the, you know, the darker, super bright colors. I usually go for kind of the lighter tones. But, you know, in getting that pack, it's, you know, it's a pretty good deal. So the shuttle art one, see how that's a little bit of a darker blue there than the previous one? Or quite a bit, actually. But see, you just come in here into these darker areas like this and the shadows, and you see how that starts to kind of model the forms a little bit more, okay? And if you're familiar with alcohol pens, you, you know you have a blending pen. The blending pen is probably not going to work as much on like a matte cardstock. It might on a coated matte, matte cardstock, but if you're working on a paper that's a little bit more sealed, um, you can kind of blend those colors right in here. Now here's a kind of a another value. It's roughly the same value as the one that I previously used, but it, it's one that's a little bit less warm and a little bit more dull in terms of the intensity. Okay. Intensity is the relative brightness of something, of a color. See how this, how I just kind of blend things out? I'm still trying to retain, though, the lighter areas that I have established by not coloring them out with the previous um, two colors. So, you know, the dark you go, remember to retain your lighter areas. If the lighter areas stand out too much because of the contrast that you're developing, then by all means, go back to, you know, your lightest color again and just adjust it accordingly, okay? All right, so you can see this modeling is starting to happen in there. I don't think you see that, you know, that really kind of mid-tone aqua in here because I've blended it out a little bit with this one, which is uh, azure blue, okay? So I mean, you can use anything. Um, let's say I didn't have four different values of blues or five or something like that. You know, there's a lot that come in, you know, between these 
three sets here, but uh, I'm this one's a little bit kind of a violet tone. You can add some of that. Get into your rocks here. It kind of changes the, uh, um, the color scheme a little bit by going into a little bit of a kind of a purplish tinge. I don't know if you can see that right in here. And this is a really light value as well. So see, I like to build up my tones through those lighter values. And when you do it like that, when you can almost barely see kind of the difference that some color is creating, it means that you have a lot of control over your application. It gets a little bit more precarious, of course, if I'm going with something like this blue right here, right? Look at the big jump in value between this one and this one, or all of these right here, okay? But if you work it incrementally through all those colors, you can, you know, just have a lot of control. Let's try this one right here. This one here's a cyan blue, okay? Let's go into some of the darker areas. I mean, you don't have to color everywhere. Maybe you use this darker tone a little bit less, or a lot less than you did with your previous ones. What I like to do is I like to start light and work darker, and then I go back to my lighter tones and add those in there, but I use those lighter tones like a blending tool, a blending instrument, okay? That will blend in that darker tone that was used. Although that one right there blended in pretty well. But let's just go in here and kind of move this around. Okay, so if you're, you're working on like a glossy cardstock, what happens is the alcohol ink that you apply on the surface of this paper stays on the surface of the paper. It's not really absorbing into the pulp of the paper, or if it is, it's not very much, so it's very surface oriented. So when you go into it again with the, another tone, because alcohol is the binder for this, you know, alcohol pens, of course, what it does is it puts the um, ink that you've already laid down in your paper, it puts it back into solution so you can really spread it around and hence, you know, they have the, uh, the blender pens, which is basically just the alcohol in a pen, you know, without any type of, um, you know, tone or color. All right, so that's that blue. I mean, I can go more, but um, let's just go with that for right now. Okay, let's look at some general tones that we might be able to utilize for sand. I mean, there's different types of sand colors, but you just pull out your pens and, uh, again, I like to start light. Eh, it's a little bit peach, but so just apply that down here and see how it looks. I think it looks pretty good. Again, it's like adult coloring books, you know. Who doesn't like coloring, you know? It's like going back to uh, you know, childhood when, you know, getting a pack of crayons or something like that was really, you know, quite special. Sometimes at the beginning of the year, you'd start off with a whole new pack of crayons and, you know, Luckily, you know, you have your favorite color, a brand new version of your favorite color again. Mine was always um, purple, but I always loved getting a new version of it because my previous pack of crayons would be, uh, you know, they'd be quite worn down or stubby, you know, if I had anything left of my favorite color. I always liked silver too, but I don't know, was silver in every pack? I don't remember. All right, that was um, something like a apricot, okay? Something like that. This one's um, beige, okay? That one's even lighter than the other one. But you can kind of blend those in. Okay, now do you see where... Um, you know, there's darker areas on the palms with huts, right? It's on the vertical side of them. The rooftops are a little bit lighter. There's some shadows in there. Get some of that color on there you can. But I like to darken the sides of my um, structures so that it looks a little bit more three-dimensional. Okay, so let's try this one right here. Brownish gray. This is one of my favorite colors right here. Eh, it might be a little bit too dark, but eh, actually not too bad. So if you color that in like so, okay. Doesn't it make those objects seem a little bit more three-dimensional by having the vertical sides of them darken? Okay, and the rooftops are lighter because it's being top lit. Okay, now if you want to get a little bit of this color in there too, it's it's not a bad idea. Okay, see that right there? 
And that doesn't look good, but what you do is just go back to your lighter tones, whatever you used, and uh, not that one. Okay, and just kind of spread that out a little bit. Now on this, I don't wait too long, okay, but it will go back into solution kind of soon after uh, you've applied it. Alright, so that kind of mixed it in there a little bit, but still get some of it. I like to go in the direction of that, uh, I don't know, whatever you call it, thatch or whatever. No, I forgot about this one in the background. Alright. Now look at, let's look at some little details here. Um, we have this, this hut's right back here, but this sand down here, we can also Let's see, this one looks pretty good. This is a camel. Let's get a little bit of a tonal variation. This camel color looks a little bit warmer. And this is a wood. Yeah, wooden sides here. So sometimes I, I just go across certain beams because you get different types of weathering on, you know, different areas of your, your objects, structures, and whatnot. So you can go across and tone in some or another, some panels of it if you want to. You can cast a little bit of a shadow, you know, on some of these rooftops. You see it's, you know, capturing the shadow of, you know, some of those palm trees. I'm just making it up here, you know, I'm not really uh, looking real specific, but See those like shadows being cast? You just go like that on some. You can say that that area is in shadow too. If it gets a little bit too choppy, just go in there and again, yeah, just kind of blend it out a little bit. And doing this too gives it a little bit of texture. What I would say is on the top surfaces of things like rooftops, though, remember to keep them a little bit lighter, at least, or a lot lighter than the sides, and it'll look real three-dimensional that way because of the uh, shading um, aspect of it. Okay, but let's see. Let's go back down here um, into the surface area, okay? What I like to do is down here in this sandy area, uh, let me see, I need to build it up a little bit. Let's see here. Let's go with a warm gray, okay? You can go along that water's edge like that. Yeah, this warm gray looks pretty good. Let me add it to some of these rocks. I like to give things continuity, so I like to use similar, you know, colors throughout my piece. I might not use them in the same degree or for the same type of purpose, but having that, those similar colors throughout your piece, even if it's in a very small area, will help to bring that continuity to your overall um, end result. Okay. Now see here I'm going kind of at the, uh, the base of these rocks down here. Okay, but let's look at these um, little tiny rocks down here. See? If some if certain things like waves are casting a shadow, you're seeing that there's the lighting in the scene is deep enough to cast shadows. So you can put little embellishments, little shadow marks at the base of all these little rocks here. It doesn't take a lot of time. There's a lot of rocks down there, but you know, how long did that take me? It took me all of you know, a few seconds to add a little bit of coloring down at the base of each one of these rocks in here. And doesn't that make it look a little bit more three-dimensional now? Having that little bit of shadow at the base of these rocks. I mean, you could go with different values down there, too. You can have some shadows darker than others. Let's try that. Let's go back to that olive brown or brownish gray. Okay, so let's hit it in these areas a little bit. Add it at the base of the wave. OK. 
Okay, there's this brownish gray up here on the uh, huts as well. Okay, now this is a tropical scene too. So, if you want to, let's say that the water color scheme is a little bit warmer than this, okay? Looks a little bit anemic right now, right? So you can go into, let's take a look at this melon, okay? It's a really pale version of a green, right? So let's take a look and see if this will influence our surface down there. Can you see the changes starting to happen? Still, I'm still trying to retain some of the lighter areas, so don't just color everything out again. Don't lose your spin drift here and whatnot. Okay, let's bring a little of this green up here into the huts, right? It doesn't turn it green, but you get a little bit of that tinge happening. And look out what you can do with it. You can really kind of add it pretty liberally down here. But, I mean, that doesn't look green, but there's a greenish, slight green tinge to it that makes it relate to this kind of tropical toned water. Okay, so this right here. So that's why working in these kind of lighter tones is really an easy way to work, you know, because you're not making that big jump from one value to the next, okay? And you can really watch what happens in a very incremental way. There's a little bit of a kind of an aqua right here. This one is ice blue. Yeah, you can hit it in a couple of these little areas. Like that. I'm just kind of doing, what I'm doing is like something like this. Okay, just little dots like that in some of these shadow areas, okay? The brightest colors are often in the shadows, you know, in the real bright sunlight. Um, you get colors kind of washing out, okay? Like high noon, bright sunlight, you know? The colors aren't going to be as intense as the colors on a kind of like an overcast day or where they're shaded and protected from the sun. So you can, you can have that brighter blue right in there, um, in the shadow of the, uh, the huts, okay, something like that. Okay, see that? Doesn't that kind of darker area in there kind of, uh, establish a nice anchor for um, that structure up there. You, know, you got to put a little bit of shading down here and it really makes it sit in the scene more. Okay, let's see here. Let's go a little bit darker on my horizon to create a little bit of a separation between sky and surface. All right, I think that looks about where I want it to go. Okay. Just all pen work, coloring, whatnot. It's pretty fun to do. Like I said, I enjoy coloring. I don't do this very often. I want to warm up these, that thatch or whatever grass on the... Uh, that's a little bit more. So we can put a little bit more warmth into the sand. Just a little bit more brightness, maybe. This one's a uh, salmon pink, huh? Okay, so that is that. Now, it really does have, there's a similar type of texture over this entire scene, don't you think? Um, the pen work all looks pretty similar to me in terms of my mark, and why wouldn't it be? Because that's all I've used on here. So what I like to do is I like to take just a cotton ball like this, and the areas where I've retained those lighter areas, okay, like in the sky, on the horizon right there, I like to reiterate that with a softer um, 
texture. Okay, so here on the horizon, let's see, let's bring in a little bit of this light into that area. Now where I'm putting in white over the top of, of something very light, you're not going to be able to see very much of a change, but let's see what it looks like on these um, palm trees. Okay, so I'm putting it in those lighter areas of the sky. Now, in terms of an object, the palms with huts are the the most distant of all objects in this composition. So what I'm doing right here in the background where those palm trees meets kind of a light sky in the background, I'm putting some of this pigment ink over them. So you see what that does? Doesn't that look, don't those trees look a little bit more distant to you because of the, uh, you know, the sea mist in the air. And do you see part of this tree right here? You know, it's lighter. It's because I've tapped some pigment ink over that side of it. So you don't have to tone everything out, okay? Just tone in certain areas like that. See those leaves right there? It just makes them look a little bit more dimensional when you do that, okay? Now let's put some of this mist maybe at the base of this, um, uh, the palms and huts here. And I'll show you how this, from a textural standpoint, really changes um, the look and feel of a thing, of, of a piece. So everything's visual, right? But from a kinesthetic standpoint, I think this really changes the look of it, okay? So see that? I've put this little tapping of pigment ink in here. See how it's very light? See, it's, I'm not working with a big glob of paint, okay? So just like color, and you can make this really easy on yourself. Now some people will go like this. I can't see anything. Well, I'm doing like 20 taps there, okay? And then the more that I do that, the more um, ink that is transferred from my applicator. But by having it kind of take, a, you know, quite a few more taps to achieve um, some sort of visual of what's happening there, it really gives you a lot of control. So it doesn't it now look like there's some fog over here and it's enveloping these palms of the huts here. So it just seems like, you know, like this misty um, quality of this location. Um, it, it Things are a little bit more varied and lit, okay? They're lighting um, that area by having a little bit, you know, white pigment ink down here. Now at the base of these rocks, okay, where these crashing waves are, I can put some of this pigment ink down here. And I don't know, that ocean is the thing that's really contributing to that kind of mist and fog. Is that right there? Doesn't it seem kind of foggier right down here in the uh, foreground? So now we've enveloped some of these rocks in this mist. You don't have to do it over all of them. When you, when you do it over all of them, too, it kind of loses a little bit of its effectiveness. Unless that's what you're going for. You want this really foggy day. It would be perfect for like a lighthouse scene or something like that. But let's run this down here in some of these rocks. And... Uh, foreground reeds, okay. All right, so that's what we get here. Let's see if we can see it. See that from a textural standpoint, doesn't it make it look a lot more sophisticated? Look at this image back there, just all stamped out in black, but then you just put a little bit of pigment ink over it. Now look how in that one impression, look how deep this space looks. It looks really close to you, and that tree in the background looks really far. All from one impression, same color of ink over it, but you just tap out some of them and put a little bit of a layer of translucent ink, you know, white ink over it. And now you have a really dimensional impression right here, okay? 
So things from a spatial standpoint have really changed in here. This area in here looks a little bit closer than this area of those rocks. Um, this palms and huts here. There's a depth to them. Let's let, let's put some mist down here on the horizon. I've defined the horizon with a you know streak of a few different colors of blue um, alcohol ink, but let's put a little bit of fog over that whole area there in the distance and see if I can make it a little bit more. I don't know, kind of atmospheric, you know, and uh, spatially deep, visually deep. Okay, so. That is that. That's a very soft application of white texture, right? Because we're applying it with a soft cotton ball. And let's go into this now with a white paint pen. And let's add even more dimension to this. Now, this would be a perfect one for the Dr. Martin's Bleed Proof White, but let's keep things really simple, although that is not a complex technique. I just want to use a couple different, you know, what is it? Three different forms of media on here. All right, so this is a white paint pen. Okay, and I can just add some splashing water into it. I don't know if you can even see it. I can barely see it. The scene didn't get too dark, so here. Uh, this pen might be a little bit... I need to shake it up a little bit more. Let me see if this one's the one that was working a little bit more. I have several of these pens, and... Some of them seem like they shake up and they give me a really crisp little dot. Some of them are a little bit more translucent, which is kind of good because if you want a real translucent one that's not going to stand out quite as much, then use that one. Or just, I don't know, don't shake your pens up so much. Yeah, this one's the one. Okay. And this little splash in water, you can put it you know, in front of some of these rocks like this. And on the crest of some of these waves, I can you know, have some of this water coming off the top of it. It's kind of a way to go back and add light back into dark, too, in very strategic areas. little striations on the water's surface, you know, those um, little bright shiny specks that's called um, specular light. Let's see if we can see it. It's it's fairly subtle because the scene didn't get too dark, but you can see this little splashy, you know, dots coming off the crest of the wave. It just gives it a little bit more dimension. I mean, you, you can do that. I forgot what it was called, but kind of pop-up type of foam applicator. It, I know a lot of people use it for snow, but you can really use it down here in the waves too because you know that. Some of those waves sometimes get really foamy, you know, looking. There's some kind of phenomenon um, with that foam, too. Sometimes I forgot what it was. I don't know if it's plankton or something mixing up with everything or what. But um, that would be perfect down here in the foreground, so you can have act something actually that's very dimensional. Okay, so anyways, I'm putting some dots down here. It's very subtle, but what you do is you have... If you have similar textures over um, different areas in your piece, what it does is it brings quite a bit of um, textural continuity to the overall part of the scene. So it might just represent reflections down here. Over here it might represent water. Um, let's take a look at, like, on these rooftops right here. I can put a little bit of kind of a highlight on them where it just represents um, lighting. 
maybe perhaps, or just the texture of that grass rooftop. For this, I like to go in the uh, in the direction of the uh, the textures of something. I don't know if you can see it there, right on top of those uh, rooftops in there. And see, I, on here I went this way, and here the, the rooftop is going this way, so I kind of streak down like that. And up here it's kind of like that again. Okay. You have the little rocks in here in the distance. You can put a little highlight on tops of some of these. These are the parts that are really fun. It's it's adding these little details here and there. Sometimes a, a few little dots, you know, can really go a long way. It depends on how much contrast you have in a scene. So, see on tops of some of these rocks right here in the foreground, you can put some highlights on them. And, I mean, these rocks down here are kind of solid black. But if I do put some highlights on the tops of one, it kind of makes sense in that you've added shadow to the base of them, so why not add a little bit of a highlight on the top of them? Okay, I don't know if you can see those, but... Um, yeah. Okay, so anyways, oh, let's see, here I added some, see these rocks right here? So just on the top sides of them, you can add some of this paint where they look a little bit more dimensional that way. See? Light on the top, darker on the bottom. Alright, so anyway, that's playing around with pens and a little bit more texture. Now, all of these concepts, you know, I mean, it is in terms of the, uh, the blending of some of those colors in here and uh, going back and putting back some of those colors back into solution with additional alcohol inks. That's something that's pretty specific to that type of media. I couldn't apply dye-based pens on here like a Tombow or La Plume and put them back into solution. I can kind of blend them a little bit more, but um, and especially if you're using like a matte paper, things soak in a little bit more, okay? But these different types of concepts in terms of your shading, um, use of texture, and general lighting concepts can be applied to whatever type of media you're working in could be colored pencils if you're working on matte paper, pastels, etc. Just vary your values a little bit. And if you don't know where to do it, just look at the design that you've stamped out. And if it's darker, like on the sides of something or at the bottom of something like these rocks, darken in those areas with whatever media you're working in. Alcohol pens, watercolored pencils, colored pencils, chalks, pastels, etc. Okay? And um, oscillate your tones, you know, don't just color in everything like this is a whole sky, but I think having those little lighter areas up there really kind of helps things out a little bit just to vary it and to not make it look um, so monotonous in terms of your coloring. And down here, you can see these areas of the, uh, the waves, but the lighter areas of the stamp I've left fairly light. I might have come into it a little bit with my lighter tones, but the darker tones tend to be um, applied in the darker areas of the designs, such as underneath those waves like that, or at the base of these rocks, etc. Okay, so this is just a real simplistic, and, you know, it's a pretty simple way of working. Work with your lighter tones. Um, don't jump into your darker tone when tones too fast. If you do apply a color that's way too dark, and if you are working on something like a UPO paper or a a vellum or a glossy cardstock like this, you can really kind of blend those colors out. You can almost take a blender pen at times, and if you hit it early enough, you can almost erase, you know, some color that you've already applied there completely off the surface. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a fun way to work, and uh, who doesn't like doing uh, coloring? I don't know. Maybe these days less so, but, uh, you know, when we were kids, we used to love coloring. This scene got two. <laughs> it's fairly light, so let me take that out so you can see it a little bit easier. Okay, so anyways, just working with uh, alcohol pens for the most part. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, drop me a note in the comments section.